we come to one of the most entertaining chapters of the Gospel of John tonight, John chapter 9. And what makes it entertaining is the main character. Actually, in this chapter, unlike most, Jesus is not the main character. He certainly is the most important character, but he's not the one who is highlighted as much. It's a rare story in the Gospels where Jesus does a healing at the beginning, and then the rest of the chapter focuses on the man who was healed and his interactions with people afterward. And he's quite the character. He's the, he's the most colorful man in the Gospel of John, other than Jesus or, the, or any of the apostles. And he's, he's quite likable. So we begin at the beginning of John chapter 9. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, this is what he said before he worked the healing. Attention was drawn to this particular man by the disciples. Jesus often would approach somebody who was sick and pass by others who were sick, and how, he, how Jesus picked them is never made very clear, except we assume he was guided by the Holy Spirit, or he was doing what his father was showing him to do. But here the disciples are the ones who called attention to this man, a beggar in Jerusalem who had uh, been seen there for a long time. As it turns out, there's quite a few people in the town who recognize him, even after he's healed. He apparently has been there a long time and uh, is a main fixture there. But his case presented a philosophical conundrum. And that was, who's being punished here? Why should a man be born imperfect? Why would a baby be born imperfect? Babies seemingly are the most innocent parties and the least deserving of being handicapped or disabled or suffering in any way. And yet babies are often born with uh, handicaps and, uh, and diseases and so forth. And this is one of the things that causes many people to uh, object to the whole notion of there being a loving God. It is one of the main objections that atheists bring is why do children die? Why do children suffer? Uh, it's one thing to say that adults have done bad things and therefore they suffer. And one could argue possibly that the suffering that they receive is earned, but how could anyone say that a baby's suffering is earned, earned, especially if he's born in that condition? Nonetheless, it is a given in most people's minds that suffering is a punishment for evil. Is it? Well, at one level, we could say that suffering is a result of sin, but that is certainly not the case in specific instances where suffering of an individual is a result of that person's sin. We could say that if Adam and Eve had never sinned, suffering would not exist. There would not be toil and sickness and death. And so all sickness could be said to be the result of sin, but that's not the same thing as saying that individual cases of suffering uh, correspond to individual sins. Yet, Ancient people, as well as modern people, cannot really see how suffering could be justified if it isn't the direct result, a direct punishment of sin. And the suffering of a baby raises particular problems because one would think a baby cannot sin prior to birth. And yet the disciples weren't sure. Because it is, of course, possible that the parents could sin and bring suffering on their child, but it doesn't seem fair. It sometimes happens. As a matter of fact, there are children who are born blind because of their parents' sins, because uh, of syphilis, which may be contracted. Possibly the child is conceived in, in an act of sin, and a venereal disease is contracted, and the child's uh, consequence is that he's blind. That would be an instance of a parent sinning and the child being born blind. The disciples probably didn't have the sufficient medical understanding to connect those things, though. 
Uh, believe it or not, we, we might think that anyone could connect those things just by observing the phenomenon, but in ancient times, people didn't know about infection, didn't know about germs, didn't know about how disease was transmitted. And therefore, they weren't thinking in terms, did the parents sin in such a way as to contract a sickness themselves, which was passed on to the child, but rather, did God afflict this child as a punishment for sins of the parents? Now, it's not a very acceptable possibility for the simple reason that the child is the one suffering for someone else's sins. It's like what the Jews claimed to be the case in the Old Testament when they said, our fathers ate the sour grapes and we are the ones who have our teeth set on edge. And they were told in Ezekiel chapter 18, don't use that parable. It's not the case. God is not punishing the children for the father's sins. It's not the fathers who ate the sour grapes and the children who are suffering by having the, the, the grimacing. Of, of the sourness, but uh, it, you know the children have themselves have eaten sour grapes and they're grimacing from their own behavior. And so it was seemed unacceptable as a thesis that the parents sinned and God was punishing the baby. And yet it seemed almost necessary because the only other option they could think of was that the baby sinned, but how could that be? The baby wasn't even born before, before the blindness was there. Could a baby sin in the womb? There actually were some rabbis that had speculated about that very thing in talking about the case of Jacob and Esau in the womb and how they were struggling with each other in the womb. Some of the rabbis taught that Esau's sinful nature, his sinful tendencies, which later manifested in his, in his lifetime, were already present with him in the womb and therefore he was already sinning in the womb. And so not all rabbis accepted this idea, but it was a notion that had been floated. And the disciples weren't sure what to think. They weren't trained theologians, but they're trying to get an answer to this. Not just this case, of course. It's not just this case they're wondering about. They're asking a general question about why are children born imperfect? Is it their fault? Is it their parents' fault? Whose fault is it? And th in this respect, they were making the same assumptions about suffering that Job's friends made about suffering. If a man suffers, he must be guilty of something. Suffering must be a punishment. But that's not always the case. You see, when people say God cannot be good and all-powerful and still allow there to be innocent people suffering, the assumption is that suffering isn't a good thing. Now, of course, it, it, a person would get himself into trouble saying that suffering is a good thing. But we cannot argue in every case that suffering is wrong or is a bad thing. Uh, a surgery that is done on a patient with cancer may be a painful surgery, but it's who's to say it's a bad thing? If a person has gangrene in their leg and to save their life, their leg has to be sawn off, that's going to be a painful procedure. But who's to say it's a bad thing? It's a necessary thing. It's a good thing. It's going to save a life. And therefore, we have to be not simplistic about suffering and thinking, well, suffering must be uh, a bad thing. And therefore, if God allows it, he must justify it somehow. Well, God doesn't have to do that. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what can be accomplished through suffering. He knows what needs to be done. And he may have any number of reasons for letting people suffer. One of them certainly may be that they've sinned and they're suffering consequences for their sins. That does happen. That wasn't the case in this case, Jesus said. In this case, that's not what's happening. Neither this man nor his sin, nor his parents sinned, excuse me, to bring this upon him. So what other options are there? Well, there might be many options for all we know, but the one that Jesus had applied in this case is that it was so that the works of God could be seen in him. Now, it sounds like he's saying this man was born, a baby was born blind, and lived, uh, you know, uh, to adulthood with this disability, suffering this handicap, for no better reason than that God's works could be seen in him. That suffering was the price that this man was paying all his life so that God could get glory. And that's exactly right. That's exactly why Job suffered too. It wasn't because Job did anything wrong. It was the price that he paid 
to have God glorified in his life. And that's what the suffering of Job was about. It was about the glory of God. That's what everything is supposed to be about. God is not necessarily glorified in all things because not everybody accepts the conditions of glorifying God in their life, which require obedience and faithfulness and hardship and so forth. But that's why suffering happens sometimes. Sometimes people suffer for no better reason than that God be glorified. But what better reason could there be than that God be glorified? That's what creation exists for. That's why we were all born. That's why the world was created. That's what the heavens declare. That's why there are stars out there. They're declaring the glory of God. And Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. The one concern the Christian has is that God should be glorified. And although non-Christians can't see the good sense in that, because they don't love God, because they're self-centered, man-centered, not God-centered. Well, that's their problem. That's what has to change in order for them to get saved. People have to become God-centered. Once you're God-centered, that means you care more about God's interests than about your own or than man's. And God, who made all things, has every right to make things as he wishes, if that will glorify him. That's what Paul said in Romans 9. Does not the potter have power over the clay to make of one vessel a vessel to honor and another to dishonor? If that will glorify him, doesn't he have the right to make whatever he wants to? Now, on the other hand, we should not think that the Bible teaches that God is callous toward human suffering and that he has no uh, sympathy or whatever, or that he's just some kind of an egotist who just wants to be glorified and he doesn't care anything about people as long as he gets his glory. God is glorified when his goodness is manifested. In this case, his goodness was going to be manifested in the healing of this man. And this man had been born in this condition and lived the years he lived in this condition for this day. For the day that he was going to be healed, that the works of God would be seen in him. And as a result, God would be glorified. Now, sometimes people are disabled and they don't get healed. That does not mean that they are not in that condition for the glory of God. God can heal them for the glory of God, or he can not heal them if he thinks he can be glorified in their illness. Johnny Erickson Tata was not born in the condition she's in, but she came into that condition through an accident when she was 19 years old. She's now near 60 years old and has been paralyzed from the neck down, and at this point she's dying of cancer, as I understand it. I've not heard the details of that, but I understand that she has terminal cancer now, too. So she's a person who's had some serious health crises. But she happens to be a person who has a Christian mindset. And she glorifies God in it. Being healed is not the only way you can glorify God through your sickness. You can glorify God without being healed. Perhaps even more so sometimes. In the Jesus movement, uh, I remember at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, there was a man who was at the meetings every night of the week. He was had some kind of disability, probably... I don't know, multiple sclerosis or something, a real severe case. I'm not sure he was quite quite uh, not in control of his muscles or, or his speech. I, I really don't know what his condition was, but he was in a wheelchair, of course, and couldn't stand up, and, and he was, you know, his arms were gimped and twisted, and, and uh, he could make noise, but he couldn't make intelligible words. But somebody had written for him on the back of his wheelchair, he said, says, I praise God, do you? And, and he did praise God. You know, during the singing, you could hear him making a loud noise and smiling and, and just praising God. And, you know, there was a, that made an impact on people. That would not be the same impact it would be made if he was a healthy man praising God. And you just never know what God intends to do. God intended to glorify himself by healing this man, and he glorified himself by healing many other people. But he also has intended to glorify, glorify himself in all circumstances, including sufferings. Job was to glorify God in his sufferings, not by being healed. Eventually, Job was relieved of his sufferings, but that's not, that's not the point at which he glorified God. It was before that time. It's when the sufferings came upon him, he said, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave glory to God. 
in the midst of his suffering. That's what he's remembered for. When it says in James, you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very gracious and of tender mercy. The patience of Job is talked about when he was suffering, not when he was relieved. You may, be you may glorify God in your death, in your sickness, in your prosperity, in your being rescued from harm. There are, in any circumstance, a person can glorify God. And we can say that whatever conditions prevail against our, our wishes, as, a, as simply the natural state into which we're born, the reason for it, whatever they were, whether we're in good health or bad, whether we are uh, you're gifted or, or inept, whether we're you know, sick or well, or whatever our circumstances, we can say that all things that God has brought about, he brought intending that he should be glorified in it and potentially able to be glorified in it. And that was the case here. Now, some people believe that people all should be healed and that God can only be glorified in people's sickness by healing them. That simply isn't what the Bible teaches. It certainly was going to be the case in this instance, and God is the one who knows when it should be and when something else is more desirable. But Jesus said, this man was born in this condition so that the works of God could be seen in him. And if someone says, well, how dare God make this man suffer for all these years just so God could heal him? I, frankly... Who, how dare he? He has the right to do whatever he wants to do. But when you think about it, this man being healed could not have been healed if he had not been blind. And if he had not been blind, if he, all the years he spent blind, I bet they were soon forgotten except as something that he rejoiced in after this, after being healed. Now some people are not healed in their lifetime, but will be in the resurrection. And no matter how much suffering we go through in this life, when it's all over and it's just a memory of something that we endured and something we were delivered out of eventually, if only through death and resurrection, it'll be something that we will gl be glad we went through. And, and so this man, I'll bet, after he was healed, he liked being the guy, the only guy who had that story. What a story it was and how much glory he brought to God. And I wouldn't be surprised if he looked back on the years he was blind and thought, you know, that wasn't all that bad now that it's over. Trials don't seem bad once they're over. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> and, uh, and so in the end, you glorify God for what he has done. You don't have to wait till the end. You can glorify him in it too. You don't have to wait. Now, the works of God was, were going to be revealed in this man. And in this case, the works of God means healing him. And Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now, when he talks about day and night here, and this is not the only place where he does, um, what is he referring to? We have him speaking similarly over in John chapter 11 when he's going to be, uh, when he tells the disciples he wants to go down and wake up Lazarus who's died. And in John 11, 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. What are these statements? What do they mean about the day and the night? Well, he says, We need to work while it is daytime. What he's saying is, he's using the, uh, an analogy of natural work and natural day. That, in those days, they didn't have cheap lighting. After the sun went down, they were pretty much, had very little they could do, except go to bed, and wait for the sun to come up. I mean, they had oil lamps and candles, but they were expensive to burn. Oil was not cheap. So they wouldn't just keep the midnight, midnight oil burning unless they had to, and they usually didn't have to. They'd usually go to bed when it got dark. They could work while it was day, and they couldn't do much else, especially since most of their work was outdoor work. They didn't have floodlights and things like that, so they could work out in the fields after dark. When the, when the sun went down, the work day was done by necessity. The opportunity had passed. 
And everybody knew when they were out in the field working the daytime that there was a limited period of time before the sun would go down. The daytime represents opportunity. Nighttime is the end of that opportunity. And therefore, what Jesus is saying, he says, I must do the works of my Father while it is daytime. Are there not 12 hours in the day? That means there's only 12 hours in the day. After that, the time is up. You have to use the hours well. You have to use the opportunities well. He's saying that we have to do the things that we are supposed to do while the opportunity still exists. While it is, as it were, still daytime. Because the night comes, which ends the opportunity to do anything. Now, for many of us, that nighttime is when we die. And therefore, the daytime is our lifetime. And the night is our death. And that was so with Jesus also. Jesus said, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But I'm leaving. And that'll be the end of the day. That'll be the end of his day to do any work on the earth personally. Of course, he continued doing his work through the disciples in the book of Acts and has done so ever since. But the point is, he had a mission to accomplish in his lifetime. His lifetime would, was going to be ending. And he needed to use the daylight hours, so to speak. He needed to use the opportunity that he had before the night would come. The night comes for every man at some point in which he can do no more work. And so he needs to seize the day. He needs to seize the opportunity. He needs to make hay while the sun shines, in other words, so that he does not waste an opportunity that is going to, is limited. And daytime is a limited period of time, is what he's saying. So he says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Everybody has his night that comes and ends his opportunity. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now, he is the light of the world while he's in the world. Well, is there any light in the world after he's gone? Well, yes, he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. And Paul said that we shine as lights in the dark world, we Christians do. And as Christians have often pointed out, preachers have often pointed out, that Jesus is like the sun in the sky. He is the light of the world in the daytime. When, when the sun is shining, it's daytime. When Jesus was here and the world could see him, it's like when the sun is visible to the world. But the sun eventually goes down. Nighttime comes. The sun is no longer visible to the world. Jesus was going to go away and they would see him no more, he said. But the light of the world continues to shine on the world through the moon, of course. When the, when the sun goes out of sight, the moon is present to reflect the sun's light to the world. The moon doesn't have any light of its own. Unlike the sun, it's not a burning orb, it's just a piece of rock. But as long as it's positioned in the heavenly places where it can still see the sun itself, it can reflect back the light of the sun to the earth. And it becomes the light of the world while the sun is absent. And so the church is like the moon. It's, it doesn't, we don't have any light of our own, but we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Uh, we see Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says. The world doesn't see him anymore, but we see him. And as we behold him, we glow. We, we, we are changed from glory to glory. We shine his light to the world, and therefore we are the light of the world in the nighttime. The day is coming again when he will appear. And the Bible speaks about Jesus' second coming as a dawning of another day. Peter says, until the day dawns and the day star arises in your hearts, we have to, he said, pay heed to the scriptures as a light that shines in a dark place. The second coming of Christ is referred to as the day of the Lord. When Jesus comes back, it's daytime again. But in a sense, every man has his own daytime and his own nighttime. The night comes when no man can work. And Jesus was going to have his limits too on his time. His, his time was running out at this point. And so he said, I need to do the works of my Father while I can. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. The word Siloam means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, he didn't see Jesus, because Jesus put mud in his eyes and sent him on an errand to wash his eyes out, and as a result, 
when he came to see him, Jesus was no longer around, and he didn't know where Jesus was. He had never actually laid eyes on Jesus at this point. But he did see things for the first time. And Jesus affected this healing using spit, and it's not the only time. Uh, there's another time in, uh, in the Gospels when Jesus used spit to open a blind man's eyes. Uh, and once he used spit to open a blind man's, uh, or not blind man, I think a, 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 a mute, a dumb man's a mouth. Jesus used spit on more than one occasion, but this is the only occasion where he actually mixed it with dirt, made uh, you know, a mud poultice, as it were, and put it in the man's eyes and told him to wash it off. Why did he do this? I don't suppose anyone knows. You know, Jesus healed a lot of blind people, but he never seemed to do it the same way twice. And I think, I think Jesus is trying to teach a lesson because people are so much wanting to learn techniques and methods of doing things. People do it all the time. You know, uh, they, they find out that somebody did a certain thing and, it, and, and their town had a breakthrough and there was a revival there. So they thought, well, we need to do that thing too and make it happen. Or somebody was at a meeting where a revival hit and the people had a certain kind of reaction, a certain kind of phenomenon occurred. They fell down. They laughed or something, and people say, well, that's what we need to happen at our church. We need to have people fall down and laugh, too. And we try to institutionalize things that should be really spiritual things. They become institutionalized and fleshly. And if Jesus had always healed the same way, his disciples who were watching and learning might have thought, oh, okay, we know how this is done. You do this, you do this, a little eye of newt, a little wing of bat, you know. Uh, this little technique gets the job done. But Jesus didn't depend on techniques. And he didn't want to teach his disciples to do so either. He may have done things that were strange just to be doing something different this time so that it wasn't the same. So that it, no one could say, well, I think I figured out how he does it. Uh, you just have to do it this because I saw him do this. I, I've got to do it this way and then it'll work. There's no technique that works. There's, uh, you know, it's the working of God. He said, these are the, my father's works. I have to do the works of my father of him who sent me. Uh, it's the Father working through Jesus. It's not the Father working through techniques and methods. And I think when the church institutionalizes things that were originally spiritual things, then it's not a positive thing. I, I believe, for example, that the Pentecostal revival in the early 1900s in, in California originally was a spontaneous revival where people were filled with the spirit and in many cases most cases I guess they spoke in tongues and it started a movement and what they do they institutionalized speaking in tongues and said okay this is what has to happen when you get filled with the spirit you have to speak in tongues well, that's not stated anywhere in scripture but that's what they decided it's what the Holy Spirit did we're gonna keep grinding out that same result and if people get filled with the spirit and don't speak with tongues we're gonna have to Teach them how to speak in tongues. Repeat after me. You know? It happens. They prime the pump. You know? And, you know, if people are known to fall down at times when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then we want that to happen with us, and if they don't fall down, we make them go down. You have people behind them to catch them. If they're not going down, that person gets on his hands and knees behind their knees, and you push them over. Not literally that bad. Not that obvious, but... That does happen. People decide that when the spirit moves, this thing is supposed to happen, and they learn the technique to get some kind of a revival or whatever. Uh, same thing with healing, same thing with deliverance. People write books about how to do deliverance, how to cast demons out of people. I don't know if I told you guys, I, I, I tell people when I talk about the spiritual warfare that when I first encountered a demon-possessed person for the first time, I didn't know a thing about it. I mean, I, I, knew, I knew the Gospels, I knew the Bible, but I'd never known anybody who had cast a demon out of someone. I'd certainly never done it, never thought about it. And I wasn't sure what to do. But I just kind of prayed and asked God to give me wisdom and, and lead me and so forth. And I did all kinds of different things that I could think of from, it seemed like the Bible might suggest this or that or other things. There's no methods in the Bible to give it. But I, you know, I, I had the person... You know, renounce things. I had them forgive people. I had them 
uh, you know, say Jesus is Lord. I, had, I did all kinds of things. I prayed for him. I, I commanded demons to go out of him. I did all kinds of things. Finally, the demons came out. And uh, once that happened, I was encouraged. I thought, wow, casting demons out of people, that's kind of cool. I like to cast demons out of people. It's great to see them delivered like that. The woman, was, the woman had been totally uh, weird, and she suddenly became normal. And uh, it was cool. I thought, well, next time I run into demon possessed person, I'm going to be more prepared. So I went out and bought some books on it. And I learned the, the rules and the techniques and the methods. So the next time I found a demon-obsessed person, I knew what to do, but it didn't work. <laughs> and the next time after that, it didn't work either. And I found that when I, on occasion, would encounter people who were demon-possessed, I got worse results after studying how to do it than I got when I never knew how to do it. I just asked God to lead me. Uh, and what I came to realize is I'm, I'm kind of trusting in these techniques I've learned from books instead of trusting in God. Well, I didn't know any techniques, I had to trust God. I just had to hope God would lead me. And he apparently did. And so Jesus is that way in training his disciples. He doesn't, doesn't really allow them to learn a method. He does it different each time. Once he spit in a person's eyes, once he spit on his hands and put them in a man's mouth, uh, once he just put his fingers in a person's eyes. On this occasion, he puts a mud pulses in the eyes. Is there a meaning to it? Is there symbolism in it? Maybe, but there might not be. It might be he's just trying to think of something different to do so he's not doing the same thing. I don't know. Uh, of course, some have suggested that since God made man from the dust of the earth, Jesus using the dust and putting his eyes was like doing a repair job on his own creation, you know, using the same materials. And that's a possibility, but uh, I don't know that, I don't know. It's possible that Jesus did it this way so that the man, by the time his sight would come to him, had been sent somewhere else and wouldn't actually see Jesus and wouldn't uh, know him until later on when Jesus revealed himself to him. But why that would be necessary is not entirely clear either. So there are things about the whys of this strange action on Jesus' part that we may never know. We can come up with theories, but none of them would really, uh, we'd have no confidence that our theory was the correct one. But the man did what Jesus said. He washed the mud out of his eyes, and he came away seeing. And therefore, it says in verse 8, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this who sat in bed, he who sat in bed? Some said, it is he. Others said, he is like him. In other words, he, he resembles him. But he answered for them and settled the question, I am he. Therefore they said to him, well, how were your eyes open? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Very simple explanation, no frills, no elaboration, just the facts. He just tells his testimony of what he knew, nothing more. He, even, he didn't even know who Jesus was. He just knew he was a man named Jesus. He must have heard the disciples speaking to Jesus by name and saying, oh, I guess his name's Jesus, whoever he, that guy is. Some guy named Jesus did this thing. And look, this is the result. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. So they brought him, who formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. Now, why to them? Uh, why not to a doctor? Why not to a medical school? to study this weird case of a man recovering from blindness uh, when he was born blind. Well, the reason they took him to the Pharisees, I believe, was because there was a religious issue that was involved here. It was not just a medical issue. And we find out what that issue was in verse 14. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So this is the same offense that Jesus had done in chapter 5 which they had never really quite gotten over in Jerusalem yet. They were, they were still perturbed that Jesus had healed the man at the pool of Siloam, uh, I mean, the pool of Bethesda, excuse me, uh, in chapter 5. And Jesus had done that on the Sabbath. And they were still not quite, at, quite uh, you know, happy about the idea that a man could do a healing on the Sabbath. Even if it was possible that a man could heal on the Sabbath, in some cases, in that case, Jesus had told the man to take up his bed and walk. 
and carrying a bed was not okay on the Sabbath. That was bearing a burden. On this occasion, it was going to be controversial, partly because Jesus healed, but also partly because of the method he used. Making mud was technically kneading. There was a uh, one of the, the tractates that the Pharisees had come up with, or the rabbis had come up with, about uh, work that could not be done on, on the Sabbath was kneading, like kneading dough, to uh, to work it, to knead dough or clay or anything else like that. That was to sort of work. Obviously, Jesus was making clay. It, it must have been a very tiny quantity, but uh, at the same time, it was the action that mattered. It was a violation of the Sabbath, or at least that was what was assumed, that people were going to consult the Pharisees about this and find out, was there some violation done? So, the Pharisees actually conduct this as a serious investigation. Uh, they, they inquire of him what happened to see if there's been any wrong done. They decide that there has been, but they can't really deal with the fact that there was a miracle worked because it's hard for them to understand how Jesus could be a Sabbath breaker and thus in their eyes a sinner. And yet God working through him uh, such a stupendous miracle is this. And so they're confused and they're doing all they can to find some way to explain the phenomenon and retain the view that they hold that Jesus is in the wrong. And so they first investigate the man himself. They inquire and let him testify. When they get nowhere, nothing out of him that, that helps them, they call in his parents for more witnesses. And then they bring him back in and cross-examine him a second time uh, because they're really struggling. They don't, they're not going to let this drop. There's something has been done they think is wrong, but obviously it has all the marks of being a work of God. But they have, they're, they're just not willing to believe that a work of God could be done on the Sabbath by a man who would thus be breaking the Sabbath in their eyes. It says, now the Pharisees also asked him again how he received his sight. He had told the crowd, or the people in the street, but uh, he now had to repeat the story for the Pharisees. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed and I see. Now it's possible that he gave a more lengthy explanation than this, but John is summarizing it because we already know the story, and no sense in going through it over and over again in detail. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, meaning Jesus is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Now, there had been earlier in chapter 7 and 8 a division among the people in the streets. Now there was a division among the Pharisees about Jesus. And they, there were two camps. In all likelihood, they corresponded with the two sides of, the, of the, the two denominations of Pharisees. There were two rabbis who basically were the heads of two different schools of Phariseeism. And one of them was somewhat more strict than the other. And many of the controversies between the Pharisees were controversies between the ideas of these two rabbis. They had lived a generation before Jesus, and therefore the Pharisees of Jesus' time were the disciples uh, of these two men. And one of them held to making judgments based on first principles. These would be the ones who would say, a man must be doing the wrong thing if he's breaking the Sabbath. The others would judge things by the results. And they'd be like the ones who say, well, wait, somebody got healed here. That, how could that not be of God? And so these were the two different opinions. They, there was a division among them. Some say, well, I don't see how we can discount that God has done something here. And the others were saying, but wait a minute. We're purists about the Sabbath, and, and it can't be God. 